Well, first, let me just uh, start off by saying uh, welcome and thank you for joining us for uh, Adobe Education's uh, webinar series on higher education and thought leadership. Uh, my name is Remy Mansfield. I work on the education programs team. And before we get started, I want to introduce this webinar series. Some of you have uh, been with us throughout the year as we have dived into what does higher education look like? What does a higher education institution look like now and potentially in the future? I think new technologies are driving this change in public and institutional policies, which in turn affect the teaching practices in classrooms. I think more people are gaining access to some form of higher education than at any other time in history. There are renewed debates around higher education's role in society and even in our personal lives. What we are trying to do with this webinar series is feature a collection of thought leaders who represent a diverse set of perspectives from the field of higher education. The goal of this series is to advance ongoing dialogue around preparing students for the future, digital pedagogy, and the College of Tomorrow. And I think that College of Tomorrow is a really good um, segue into introducing uh, today's uh, final webinar in our series for this year. Uh, let me first um, start by introducing Erica Mall. Erica Mall is founding executive director of the USC Ivine and Young Academy. And she'll discuss uh, the program's radical new Bachelor of Science degree in art technology and the business of innovation, as well as the new literacies that will allow coming generations of college graduates to master change by unlinking innovation from state-of-the-art technology. I've gotten to know Eric over this year and hear about the incredible program and really impressive students and the work that they're doing on her campus in her academy. Um, I'm looking forward to having a discussion with her today, and I welcome all of you to uh, remember to uh, add to the discussion and save your questions in our chat pod here. I'll be monitoring the chat pod throughout, um, and I welcome any questions, thoughts, or ideas as you hear from Erica today as she talks about the Academy and its program. Uh, thanks, Remy. Thank you. Uh, and thanks to everybody for joining in today. I'm um, excited to have the opportunity to talk with you uh, about the Ivy and Young Academy at USC, a new program uh, that is designed to address the changing needs of higher education students uh, and really the dramatically changing landscape in the fields and disciplines traditionally served by higher education programs. Uh, the Academy's curriculum is uniquely integrative of multiple disciplines. Uh, which is why, as you can tell by the title of my talk today, we don't refer to it as interdisciplinary, uh, but rather as something that's broken from the boundaries of not just traditional disciplines, but the traditional modes of educating in those disciplines as well. Um, before I go into the specifics of the program, I want to talk first a little bit about how we at USC see higher education today, where we are, and where we believe we will need to go if we're going to keep pace with the rest of the world. This uh, slide that you're looking at now is a prediction on the part of the U.S. Department of Labor that was first published in 1999 after extensive research into how the internet and other digital technologies were likely to change commerce. Um, it was not only accurate, uh, I think we can all agree that it was actually too conservative in its timeline uh, because we're already in the midst of dramatic changes to the traditional career paths for college graduates. And higher education institutions around the world are really dealing with what that means uh, for our future viability. As just one example of the growing gap between higher education and the rest of the world, uh, I invite you to think about this, for example. Colleges and universities have flourished by defining specific career outcomes for their students and educating towards those outcomes. Um, under this current system, if you want to create a new undergraduate program, as we have with the Academy, uh, you will typically begin that process at least six to seven years prior to the expected date of graduation of your first class. Um, that's typically two to three years of designing and approving curriculum, and then, of course, the four-year path to the degree. Uh, to me, the only surprising thing about this luxurious timeline is that it's actually worked incredibly well for higher education for a very long time. 
Uh, and I think we can all agree that if you ran a business today on a seven-year innovation cycle, you'd be passed up by the startup down the block in about a year. Uh, but today, finally, even higher education is feeling the pinch of an economy that is driven by rapid and often society-changing technological invention. Um, because today, virtually every degree crosses technology in some way, and any such information included in a curriculum will have at best a three-year obsolescence, and it will certainly be mostly, if not fully, irrelevant in seven years. So in building the Ivy and Young Academy at USC, the first critical challenge for us was while staunchly maintaining traditional academic rigor, um, holding the line against teaching towards trends, uh, we had to find ways to become much more responsive to changes in the outside world. We felt that one of the first ways to do this uh, was to do something that many people in education are talking about, and that was to focus our classrooms away from imparting knowledge and instead on contextualizing knowledge and providing methods and tools for analysis, critical thinking, and of course problem solving. Um, one of my design faculty in the academy very correctly said to me as we were working on the curriculum, Erica, technology will change. The ability to have and set in motion a great idea will of course never become obsolete. Along with changes in the outside world, all of higher education, I think, needs to be aware of how our students are now getting and sharing information as well. Um, and as a result, how the classroom itself is adapting and will need to continue to adapt. Um, we are already seeing really rapid adoption of gaming platforms in digital learning interfaces, which are, of course, ideal for evaluating competencies. Uh, we are also seeing general advances in digitizing the classroom, including new forms of instant visual communication and information sharing that support more collaborative learning environments. Um, there are a number of uh, people's websites, etc., focused uh, specifically on collaborative learning right now uh, and dedicated to this topic. For example, teambasedlearning.org. Uh, lists any number of studies on the effectiveness of team-based and collaborative learning if you're interested in following up on this in particular. Um, many in higher education are predicting that by 2020 we will see full implementation of disintermediation or the removal of the teacher as the direct conduit for information to students. This trend is visible already in the rising number of so-called flipped classrooms in which technology provides the relevant information and teachers are, as I suggested earlier, focused on contextualizing that information and providing critical input on student projects. This flipped format, um, by the way, resembles the primary teaching model of the creative arts, which uses student projects as the basis of hands-on learning. This, in particular, is an, a very important part of the Academy's premise and something that I'll expound on later. Um, and by the way, I also think that this prediction uh, as a whole is way too conservative, as uh, I think I'll show you in just a bit. By 2025, uh, the Internet of Things will be providing even greater individualization to curriculum and thus to student outcomes. And by 2030, we will undoubtedly see widespread use of both physical and virtual studio or classroom spaces. Um, but remember, not just as we have it today, but further enhanced via advanced technologies such as holography, augmented and virtual reality, and again through IoT, uh, which includes body computing and neuroinformatics. Um, so in building the academy, the second critical challenge um, that we felt we had to face was rethinking our educational spaces and our modes of instruction immediately uh, and making wholesale changes now to stay relevant for the coming wave of new learners. So along with the changes in the fields for which we're educating and changes in both the types of information we need to impart and the modes in which we need to impart them, uh, we also feel that higher ed must now deal with an entirely new student from the one we're used to educating. <clears throat> Students that are applying to college today present a profile that is certainly different from any that I've seen in my 27 years in higher education. And it's a profile that has now been studied by experts at some length, some calling these students Gen Z and others just calling them digital natives. 
um, whatever you want to call them. I think it's important to keep in mind that students entering college today were all born after 1998. So they are the first generation to have grown up with a fully functioning internet. And very importantly, for probably the last 10 years of that internet, a steady supply of easily accessed high-level content from some of the best colleges and universities in the world. I mentioned earlier that I thought the prediction of disintermediation by 2020 was too conservative. Um, in fact, in my opinion, we can't flip the role of the teacher fast enough to stay up with this generation. Um, let me explain a little bit more about that and um, specifically what we're already seeing at the academy. Uh, the students that we're attracting, and I, and I don't think they're exceptional for this generation, are post-linear learners, which means they're capable of multitasking at incredible rates and absorbing huge amounts of data from multiple sources at once. Um, as a result, they're able to make great leaps in understanding and knowledge very quickly. And because of their comfort with the digital realm, they're also by nature autodidacts, preferring to seek out information from digital rather than human sources, and they engage in heavy peer-to-peer -peer learning through social and other media. Um, for us, all of this adds up to the undeniable fact that they know more about things than any previous generation in history, and they view the world from a natural, big picture, or if you prefer, global perspective. Uh, these students are also extremely entrepreneurial, which is not surprising given the capability of the internet to encourage and support a DIY culture. Um, a study with internships.com, for example, showed that 72% of students under the age of 18 want to start their own businesses, which is a shift from previous generations. Uh, further, their confidence in their ability to learn or conquer anything is profound and no surprise to anyone, they're natural leaders. As a group, they also have a strong social conscience uh, and a number of recent studies show 60% of students in this generation pointing just to making an impact as their number one goal in life. They're also community oriented, tolerant, smart, uh, adaptive, intellectually very agile, and of course post-literate, which means that they relate to the world through visual rather than written language. Um, this last trait is very important, I think, to keep in mind um, as we move into our discussion of uh, the Academy's curricular model, and in particular of 21st century literacies and the importance of visual communication skills. So the third critical challenge for us in building the Academy was to completely rethink what we thought we knew about our audience and respond appropriately. And to address all three of these challenges that I just identified, we of course did what any good innovators would do, we hacked the bachelor's degree. Um, across the country, we are seeing excellent movement on centers or institutes working to rethink undergraduate education, but few major institutions who are willing to blow up existing models and start from scratch by launching new degrees. Um, frankly, uh, this is very understandable. It's a huge undertaking to start a new degree. Um, and uh, a degree like the Academy's degree, for example, which offers a completely untraditional course of study uh, without a, an established career path is particularly daring. For us, however, it was the only option if we were going to move the dial on education as quickly and effectively as we felt we needed to. Um, I think it's important to state that it was also, by the way, in keeping with the nature of the gift from Jimmy Iovine and Andre Young, innovators themselves in the worlds of music and tech, and of course, entrepreneurs who were willing to allow us to break a few molds. So just um, a few of the basics of the program. The Academy was founded in 2013. Uh, we opened our doors to our first freshman class in 2014. Uh, as you can see, it offers a Bachelor of Science degree that focuses at the intersections of art and design, business and venture management, engineering and information technology, and communication. Um, it's an unprecedented collaboration of schools, deans, and faculty at USC, and I would venture probably anywhere in the world. Our annual cohort target is 25 kept intentionally small to facilitate a very low student to faculty ratio, a collaborative, team-based, hands-on educational environment, and of course the ability to create 
individualized courses of study for each student. <clears throat> We selected the partner schools that you see here because we believe that each of these core disciplines offered uh, or offers, excuse me, what we have identified as a new literacy for the 21st century. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about that concept in a bit, again, when I get to the curriculum. Um, unlike normal interdisciplinary programs uh, that package existing coursework into new minors or majors, we did build each academy course from scratch carefully integrating into every classroom and every project or assignment concepts, skills, and methodologies that can be applied universally to high-level problem solving from that big picture perspective that I mentioned earlier, and of course as a complement to disciplinary expertise. Along with the integrative cross-disciplinary model, uh, probably the most unique aspect of the Academy is that while it's a program that attracts a lot of young tech entrepreneurs. Its pedagogical model is based on neither engineering nor business programs, but rather on the arts, and in particular on design. We did this quite consciously in an endeavor to bring the arts natural focus on individual creativity and the pedagogical methods used to achieve that to bear on the other disciplines. Um, we think we've also enhanced even the arts-based model in two ways. Uh, first, by essentially removing prerequisites and allowing students to go as far and as fast as they can based on competencies. And second, by the almost total removal of the single faculty expert from the head of the classroom. Um, on this last point, um, I just want to add that I've been a professor at USC since 1990 and a tenured full professor since 2004. And when I walked into the classroom, I had full autonomy over what, when, how, and to whom I taught. Um, it might be surprising to you then that for the academy, I built a model in which no faculty member is an island, and highly skilled, highly accomplished faculty experts are collaborators in a fully unified, fully integrated cross-disciplinary curriculum. Uh, faculty from multiple disciplines weigh in on every syllabus, every project in the program, uh, pretty much aligning everything with the Academy's educational mission and, of course, the needs of our students. Also, team teaching is fairly normal. Um, we have one class going forward right now, for example, that actually has five faculty members assigned to it. I'll explain a little bit more about that. That is a little extreme even for our model, but we did find it necessary for one uh, particular um, classroom experience. So the Academy allows for great flexibility in tailoring individual degree paths and for students to craft specializations in virtually any discipline found at USC. Um, that said, as I mentioned earlier, we did intentionally focus its core on areas that we consider to be new literacies for the coming generations. Um, you see here the first, art and design, and uh, we believe at the Academy that the need for visual and audio design skills in a program that is basically for young entrepreneurs is clear. Uh, Two-dimensional graphic design has for decades been the basis for communications and marketing around the globe, and with worldwide communications migrating from print to the internet and social media, the ability to design in three and four dimensions, and of course the fourth dimension is time-based media, uh, we feel is equally important. Um, three and four dimensional design is of course also the basis of many other traditional and emerging forms of design, including product design, packaging, environmental or spatial design, and user interface and experience design and development. Uh, technology, as you can guess, is not part of the academy merely because today's entrepreneurs need to have technological skills to remain competitive, but because it's who these students already are. They grew up with it, they use it constantly, they understand its capabilities and its possibilities far better than we do. Also coding, programming, and development are certainly literacies for this century, uh, as is an understanding of materials and a facility with advanced digital technologies for design and manufacturing. Uh, we feel that whether an innovation is designed for profit or not for profit, and by the way, in the academy, we do have many students working on nonprofit or humanitarian efforts. 
Uh, we still believe that sound business and management skills are essential to any endeavor. Um, students in the academy learn really from the outset, guiding principles for vetting, developing, financing, manufacturing, marketing, and disseminating their ideas. Um, communication, of course, key to virtually everything. Uh, theory, analysis, and applied communication strategies um, that help our students manage visual, oral, and written communication are interwoven really throughout the program, um, uh, throughout uh, multiple courses, and both at the lower and upper divisions. As a complement to the integrated curriculum, the Academy provides instruction in a variety of ways and in an educational setting that is drawn from the arts and applied sciences, meaning really a studio or lab setting. Um, <clears throat> as I mentioned before, Academy courses rely heavily on team-based student projects and an instructional environment that focuses on iterative design as driven by experimentation and critique. Uh, to help this, we designed our first space, uh, the garage, to allow students to move seamlessly from classroom to studio to fabrication lab. Uh, our students are also hands-on from day one with the garage's digital fabrication technologies, and they are encouraged, of course, to work on extracurricular projects as well as class assignments. In addition to the garage, which was actually designed as the Academy's senior year incubator and accelerator, beginning in the 2018-19 academic year, students uh, will move into the Academy's primary home, Ivy and Young Hall. The hall will incorporate everything that we're learning from the students' use of the garage. It will also feature a 10,000 gross square foot maker space equipped with state-of-the-art design, media, and fabrication facilities. Um, this may surprise those of you out there who are uh, higher education teachers. We're also continuing to grow and adapt our collaborative model uh, in the faculty spaces in the new building as well. Um, you see here a concept rendering of what our faculty offices will look like. Uh, it's clearly a departure from the long hallways and closed doors typical of higher education, and it's much more like one might, what uh, you might find on the creative campus of a forward-thinking tech company. The space is, of course, designed to encourage crosstalk and collaboration much more than private meetings, uh, but it will, of course, be supported by a number of different sized meeting and breakout rooms, providing privacy as and when needed for both students and faculty. So to bring you up to speed on where we are at the moment in the program on our students and what they're working on, um, I think first it's helpful to understand the Academy's recruitment and admissions process, which is, I think, very different uh, from most programs and which helps us attract and identify this new generation of creative thinkers. So this slide that's up now is directly from our website, and it shows the profile that we seek in incoming freshmen. As you can see, this is a very broadly crafted list of attributes ranging from ability in the arts to ability with subjects that require extensive math and science to demonstrated capacity as an entrepreneur and a leader. Um, there are some intangibles here as well, of course, curiosity, initiative among them. Uh, and my favorite, an ability to accept periodic failure as a vital component of innovation. Um, because of this broad set of attributes, you can imagine it might be fairly difficult to find these students. Um, and in fact, it is. And therefore, our admissions and recruitment process is quite a bit more extensive than, than the usual program. Uh, we, of course, have all of the information in the common application, uh, but we felt we definitely need more. And so we ask each student to submit a creative portfolio, which can include examples of original music, art, design, film, creative writing, uh, but also, of course, creative technologies, inventions, and really more. We, we define creative very broadly in the academy and look very closely um, at the individual submissions. Uh, academy students uh, do, however, need to be makers. And the portfolio requirement assists us in identifying that particular mindset. 
We also ask for a one minute pitch video, the prompt for which you also see on this slide. Um, I have to say the videos tell us more about our applicants than any other element of the submission package, including whether or not uh, the students are natural communicators. Um, I have uh, today two of the many amazing videos that we've received in the past three years, um, and I'd like to show, show them to you. Uh, both of them were submitted by 17-year-old seniors in high school. Uh, the first one is uh, a pitch for a product for the growing number of video bloggers or vloggers. Without the time, funds, and technical training, vloggers often find setting up lighting expensive, difficult, and time consuming, and many choose to film on the go, so using traditional studio lighting is impossible. Arcam offers a solution. Designed to resemble the popular Iron Man's arc reactor to appeal to the young demographic, 77.6% of vloggers being under 35 years of age, it allows easy, portable lighting. The main light can be hung on the camera lens to illuminate the subject, which is ideal for capturing a vlogger's face. The secondary light is attached to a detachable mini tripod that has the additional feature of a clip, so it can be placed on or clipped on to any surrounding object or surface. Both lights are packaged in an aluminum case kept in place by latches and are powered by solar panels on the backside of the case. It has detachable straps that, when removed, unfolded, and stretched, can be used as light reflectors, diffusers, or green screens. Arkham can be carried easily like a small backpack when the straps are connected, and is small enough to fit inside most bags. Um, so, uh, what did this video tell us? Um, the student compiled, obviously, a very effective pitch uh, utilizing uh, art, design, technology, engineering, uh, marketing, uh, market analysis, storytelling, uh, all in 60 seconds, which is pretty amazing. Um, the product doesn't exist. Uh, it was just an idea. But in pitching it, the student thought of most of the wrinkles inherent in bringing an idea to market, including size, weight, materials, demographic. Um, and she also used incredibly effective graphic design, animation, and even references to popular culture, in this case, Iron Man, to pique the consumer's interest. Most importantly, this video told us that this student has a natural gift for design and communication and thinks like an entrepreneur across a big picture. Um, it truly would have been impossible to discern all this uh, from a normal applica application, so I think you can see how helpful this has been. <clears throat> the second video I'm going to show you is fairly self-explanatory in terms of the technology it's pitching, which I think is in itself a storytelling achievement. Uh, so let us get to that one. Nice and slow, yeah. Hey, now listen up and listen real close. Hey, hey, hey. So again, uh, what did this video show us? Certainly a great idea that would likely appeal to virtually anybody with a smartphone, but also first-class graphics, filmmaking abilities, including direction and editing, incredible pacing, and an overall facility with visual communication that, as you can see, is really quite superior. Um, additionally, and of course this information was gleaned from the common application, at the time of this submission, this student was still the youngest person ever invited to Apple's Worldwide Developers Conference, and he had a number of apps already on the marketplace. So he could have coded and developed this app very easily. He chose not to. Um, and what's truly interesting is after three years in the academy, he's actually applying 
these considerable gifts in much more interesting and impactful ways, uh, which I'll talk about a little bit um, in the section on curriculum. So in addition to the videos, uh, we have yet um, uh, another step in the application process um, that, let me get back. Uh, it's okay, we'll move forward. Um, we have another step in the application process that is not usual for undergraduate programs, um, except in the applied arts. Again, so we interview in person between 60 and 70 shortlisted applicants uh, bringing them to USC for an extended weekend in February each year. Uh, my faculty and I spend um, the entire weekend with the applicants and their families, typically, in interviews, at meals and events, and uh, getting to know each of them very well. It's an enormous expenditure of time and resources, but it helps us identify the final admits, I believe, as nothing else could. Uh, including, uh, very importantly, how various personalities are going to mesh in the cohort setting. Um, on that note, uh, the slide that you're seeing now uh, is uh, a visual of what we try to create in our cohort. And in my opinion, one of the greatest strengths of the program is the cohort model. We craft each 25 student cohort for maximum diversity admitting a deliberately broad range of both disciplinary strengths and backgrounds, uh, including socioeconomic backgrounds, of course, but also viewpoints and stated life goals. We believe in inclusion as it applies to every aspect of a human being and as defined very broadly. And we found that both the synergies and the initial tensions that this creates makes for an incredibly vibrant and appropriately challenging collaborative creative environment. To give you an idea of the level of diversity in the program, uh, here are our current stats. Uh, to date, we have 81 students total in the first three cohorts, freshmen, sophomores, and juniors. We're currently recruiting our fourth class. Um, academy students, as you can see, sit at the high end of USC incoming GPAs and test scores, which I have to be honest, initially surprised us. We thought that if we were looking for disruptive iconoclasts, they would also have challenged the traditional modes of assessment in high school, but apparently not. However, though most of our students are very high traditional academic achievers, we strongly encourage students with diverse academic profiles to apply, and we admit students with those profiles every year. We're very proud of our other stats as well, including that over 50% of our students identify as female and 20% as underrepresented minorities, both very high numbers for programs that focus on technology. Um, I'm going to show you now just a, a few specifics on the curriculum uh, and through that what our current students are working on. So we launched the program in 2014. Uh, we made changes to the curriculum in 2015 and 2016 and we have pending approval for fall 2017, the largest revision yet. Uh, and one that finally reflects the number of native courses the Academy has built out in the past three years. Uh, you're looking on this slide at the lower division requirements. Um, I talked earlier about the focus on integration of disciplines, on a team-based hands-on studio environment, and on creating a very strong real-world interface for our students. The Academy's core uh, does this through two basic types of courses, those that focus more exclusively on the core disciplines, engineering, design, business, and communication, uh, and those that teach a homogenous, fully integrated approach to the subject matter. So just a few examples of the more focused classes. Uh, disruptive innovation is primarily a business course that provides a historical and analytical look at major innovations throughout time, uh, the sociopolitical environments in which they've occurred, and the intended and unintended byproducts of those innovations. Uh, the toolboxes that you're looking at, the digital toolboxes, are skills-based courses that provide a deep dive expertise in all of the relevant business tech and design software used by our students, which of course includes Adobe Creative Cloud. Uh, Dev1, Dev2, Dev3 provide uh, foundations and more advanced thinking in the areas of coding and programming and web and mobile-based development. Some examples of the latter, more homogenous type of course include our Innovators Forum, which is a series that brings innovators in all walks of life into the academy as guest speakers. 
Uh, but the course also turns the tables on students and asks them to team solve problems uh, that are provided by each speaker and drawn from current issues in the speaker's field. The speaker then acts as guest faculty, critiquing student solutions that must engage the problem from a multidisciplinary 360 degree vantage. You can see here our upper division coursework, which exhibits again full integration of the disciplines as students head toward their capstone projects in the garage, uh, which is basically their entire senior year. Um, it's small, it's a lot of them. I don't know if you can see it well, but this is a list of our sample electives. Um, it's a growing list of mostly existing and a few currently proposed electives for academy students. We're also in process on the creation of an academy minor now that we've launched sufficient coursework to accommodate that. Um, the new building will also help us accommodate increased numbers of non-major students in our classrooms, which is also a goal. So I want to give you a bit of a closer look at three of the core courses which exemplify the Academy's hands-on uh, experiential approach. Though essentially a design course, rapid visualization teaches students to quickly and effectively visualize concepts and ideas uh, in two dimensions and three dimensions, utilizing both analog and digital production means, which basically means that they're working with everything from pencil and paper to state-of-the-art rapid prototyping technologies. We believe that visualization is the first step in team-based problem solving. Once visualized, an idea can be worked on by many people and from multiple perspectives, uh, which we believe leads to subsequent iterations and better solutions. Case studies and innovation prevents a, uh, excuse me, presents a variety of essential business concepts through the lens of case-based studies that focus on viability, feasibility, and desirability in designing and vetting an idea. Uh, on this side, you are actually looking at our students realizing experientially through their own watercraft designs, the Harvard Business School case study on the Vasa, the 17th century Swedish battleship that cost the country 5% of its GDP and sank a mere 14 seconds after launch. Um, in hindsight, the disaster was blamed on an overbearing monarch and a design team that was too afraid to push back on the monarch's continual demands for additional features. Our students experienced the designer's dilemma firsthand, uh, initially through the limitation of building materials that were completely insufficient for the purpose, uh, specifically cardboard and duct tape, and then an instructor that texted almost hourly during the final phases of the assignment, changing the parameters of the build and shortening deadlines. Discerning and making is the core junior year experience, which we just launched this fall for the first time. It's designed as a practicum that places academy students uh, into positions as consultants to real clients working on real world problems. This year, the clients range drastically in both their makeup and their business focus, and they present very different challenges for the students. Uh, the students are, for example, working with New World Symphony, uh, which is a nonprofit youth orchestra in Miami. They're working on the future of the live music experience. Viasat is a cyber communications company that's working with our students on a system to facilitate global Wi-Fi. Uh, Tom's is the iconic shoe company, notable for their eco-friendly fabric shoes and one-for-one -one social entrepreneurship model. Um, students are working with Tom's uh, to develop a campaign and infrastructure to induce and train companies around the world to adopt social entrepreneurship as their own model, which is a really interesting project for them. Uh, Adam HP, our final uh, partner, is an interdisciplinary group of leading cancer researchers here at USC. And their project with the Academy is working to introduce human-centered design into cancer research and patient care in order to improve patient outcomes. I want to give um, a little shout out to this last project. Uh, we are seeing that design is already proving to be an incredibly effective catalyst in advancing cancer patient care. Uh, the uh, Academy project, including much of the developments provided by Ivy and young students, was invited to the White House to take part in the South by South Lawn Innovation Festival this past September. And the project has now also been officially adopted by the White House as part of Vice President Biden's Cancer Moonshot Initiative. So as an aside, um, the young technologist whose video you saw earlier is one of the students 
that has made significant design contributions to the patient-facing technologies that are at the heart of this particular project. So with the Academy's multidisciplinary uh, goals, which are quite ambitious, we knew we would have to do significant educating outside of the 128 unit degree if we were going to maintain sufficient rigor in each of the core disciplines. So in addition to the required curriculum, we built a program called Curriculum Plus that provides essential lessons on a variety of topics and in a variety of ways. Uh, what's important, though, is that all of the programs in Curriculum Plus are non-unit bearing and free to students. Uh, so in addition to the Innovators Forum, for example, which is an actual class, we also have throughout the year what we call drop-in speakers, where innovators uh, in virtually any field meet casually with students over lunch to discuss their work. Um, we also created a communal open time slot in the Academy student schedules in each week during that time, we offer a topic or sometimes a series of topics germane to student needs. The specific topics or speakers are typically generated by student requests, which is why we call them responsive learning modules. Um, what you see here is just a few examples of some of the areas covered so far. We also offer a number of opportunities throughout the year uh, and during summer for study tours that take students outside of the school and into some of the world's most innovative companies and institutions. Uh, again, just a few of them here. And paid internships are a critical part of the learning experience and are both strongly encouraged and facilitated by the Academy. Um, once again, you see here some of the companies that have selected our students for these positions uh, most, actually after extremely competitive searches. So that brings me pretty much to the end of my presentation, but before taking your questions, and uh, since storytelling is part of everything we do at the Academy, I'd like to end the presentation with a visual experience, uh, which is the video that greets everyone that comes to our website at iavine-young.usc.edu, uh, which I hope you'll check out if you have a moment. Makers, creators, and doers. We're entrepreneurs, engineers, designers, and artists. We're also called inventors, innovators, outliers, and dreamers, because we see things differently. Where others see difficulty, we see opportunity. While others adopt, we rethink, rebuild, and repurpose. While others seek the right answer, we seek to change the question. Our comfort zone is changing the game, changing the world, and then, doing it all over again. This is where we unite. A new school for a new world, where the old rules no longer apply. The philosophy is simple. Bring together like-minded makers who understand nothing less than excellence and who seek to create change through original thought. Offer them a custom-built collaborative space and a wealth of educational, creative, and technological resources. Give them powerful skills and the ability to apply those skills universally around the globe. Allow them to customize what and how they learn in a community they can't find anywhere else in the world. Then get out of their way, because anything is possible. We're searching for innovators at the crucial intersection of the arts, technology, and business. The ones who will shape our tomorrows. Are you one of us? Thank you, Erica, for such a great presentation and uh, a deep dive into what you all are doing at the Academy. It's super inspiring. And I think, as I mentioned at the beginning of this uh, presentation, this discussion today, uh, is really a great way to cap off our webinar series about thought leadership, about how higher education is changing, uh, giving, I think, all of us a vision of what, uh, I, I don't want to say tomorrow because it's actually happening today. Um, but what, what it could be and how, how we could be uh, innovating and how it's done. Um, I'm not going to be selfish and ask my own questions, although I have a list. Um, what I'll do is I'll, I'll take questions from the chat pod here. And then for any moments for questions coming in, um, I may insert a couple. We have one here from uh, Jeff George who asks, how do you think K-12 schools can prepare more students to engage in programs like Ivy? A great question and a very simple answer. Put the arts back into K-12. through 12. 
um, we, we believe we're actually one of the best um, uh, case studies uh, for why the arts need to be present in K through 12. Uh, the students that we are drawing, that we are attracting, um, and that we are admitting uh, are, are showing a definite, a definite propensity for this type of thinking because of the activities, the types of activities and the type of education that they've had. Uh, sometimes uh, it's an educational environment that, that comes from the school. Sometimes it's an educational environment that's found at home. Uh, but uh, we believe that creative thinkers, which you know you can call them innovators if you like, are not built in college. They're not even built in high school. They're built from very early ages on. And um, so I, I do believe that we need to begin to understand uh, the bigger picture of what the arts bring uh, to uh, the development of students from, as I said, very early ages on. Another question here from Megan. Uh, this kind of change is vital, uh, but must be hard. What strategies did you find successful for changing existing practices? with already established faculty? Yes, <laughs> that's an excellent question. Um, so uh, you'd be surprised uh, by how many faculty are already encountering these uh, new types of thinkers in their classrooms and are already beginning to, to discover uh, that they, they need to really educate in a different way. They need to allow the students uh, to go through their coursework in a different way. And so it's it's not quite as difficult as it might have been even 10 years ago. Uh, good educators are, are seeing the changes that I've outlined here. And, uh, and we've actually had a number of people come to us and say, you know what, this is, this is the type of platform that I want to work in, this is the type of platform that I want to teach in. Uh, I, I'd like to be part of the academy. So, uh, so that has been, has been wonderful, finding those native thinkers and those native teachers to be able to, to help us move this forward. Uh, outside of that, it, it has involved, as I mentioned, a great deal of teamwork. Uh, first of all, spending a lot of time with faculty in groups. Uh, I meet with the interdisciplinary faculty every week for two hours uh, at the academy, and we discuss the entire program. We discuss every student in the program, and, uh, and we talk about uh, how each class is working uh, and literally the, the compilation of, of disciplines within that class and how they can work better. Um, so it began as, as uh, more of an interdisciplinary team. Now it's a much more homogenous thought process because over the years we've all learned uh, how, we, how we think. Uh, those of us in one discipline understand the other disciplines better. And so we're all beginning to use a similar language and, uh, and to row in the same direction, if you will. I, I do believe that will happen in any environment, just given enough time uh, and enough uh, willingness to be able to uh, listen to those other disciplines, understand their vernacular, understand their methods and their methodologies. And, and Benjamin has a, a, a comment and a question here. Congratulations, wonderful program and ideas. Uh, University Park, where USC is located, has uh, about a 48% uh, percent Latino population, but only 8% of your students are Latinos. Uh, any actions towards inclusiveness? Well, uh, as I mentioned, for a program that focuses on technology, we are um, really doing extraordinarily well with our numbers. Um, and we're, we reach out uh, both in our neighborhood, of course, uh, and across the country, really, to try to get as, as much diversity into the program as we possibly can. We're also working with partners here in South Los Angeles uh, to help develop feeder programs for the academy. We work with one group in particular, uh, uh, TXT, which is Teens Experiencing Technology. That is a program that focuses uh, specifically on at-risk uh, African American and Latino uh, teens. And um, it's, it's been a program that we've been partnered with now for, I think, three years. And it's going very, very well. We, we believe um, in sometimes not reinventing the wheel. If there are people in our neighborhood or in our city that are doing these things incredibly well, we're actively seeking to partner with them uh, to uh, bring what we do uh, in front of them, uh, learn from what they're doing as well, and, uh, and, and try to build out these pipelines as effectively as we possibly can. 
Thank you, Erica. Another uh, question here from, from Benjamin. Uh, I think in reading about your background and your experience, uh, you know, how has your background as a concert pianist, a conductor, and composer, uh, how does that help you in your current and future leadership roles? How, how have you seen that come to bear within the position you are in now? Yeah. Well, as I mentioned, um, you know, the program is, uh, um, is something that has been built on what we call arts-based thinking. And um, the creative arts tend to engender comfort with quite a few things that are really relevant to this program, uh, risk-taking, uh, a comfort with long periods of ambiguity while you, while you work out problems and uh, struggle for solutions that are at a higher level. And, um, and composers, uh, like all creative artists, are problem solvers. You have to be a problem solver as a composer because the, the materials that I have to work with uh, always have limitations. Uh, when I was working as a composer, I was always trying to consider my ideas, my artistic ideas, my creative ideas, and how those hit up against uh, the limitations of the instruments, the limitations of the players themselves, when was something too fast for the hands and too slow for the breath, um, acoustic limitations, physics, etc. And so um, you learn as a creative artist to just problem solve constantly, and you learn to problem solve from uh, multiple directions. I think that's, that was probably excellent training for me for this, um, but also my 30 years as an educator in higher education, I only came out of the classroom three years ago uh, where I had been firmly ensconced uh, teaching both at the undergraduate and graduate levels. And I consider myself first and foremost a teacher. And so bringing together everything in my research, my creative background, and everything uh, that I have learned as a teacher and as a pedagogue uh, over the past few decades, um, you you cannot miss what's happening in higher education today. You cannot miss the changes in the students. And you can't miss what's going on in the outside world that we need to consider uh, in terms of educating our students. So um, I, somebody else asked me this question once. And, um, and my answer was, I, I think I've been being prepared for this job uh, since the, the very beginning of my life. You know, this this takes me back to the beginning of your presentation where you talked, I think your quote was, uh, hacking the bachelor degree. Any good entrepreneur starts with sort of hacking something, taking it apart. Um, in this webinar series, we've talked about sort of advice to give to those who are listening um, about where to start. I guess thinking about this idea of hacking the bachelor degree and thinking about our audience being a mix of administrators, um, also faculty, staff, professors, maybe working at a center uh, within a university structure or a small college. Where do you recommend um, that people start at their institution to start making these changes or start aligning to programs, maybe more like the teaching experience or learning experience you're creating? Right. Um, uh, seeking out colleagues, like-minded colleagues, is the easiest way to do it. Um, the the uh, Goodwill of the faculty is essential, obviously. And uh, I'm very lucky that at USC, uh, we are a major research institution. Uh, there are extraordinary faculty in uh, so many interesting disciplines uh, across the university. And, uh, and so we've been able to draw on that strength uh, to be able to make the academy as diverse as it is academically. Uh, but again, I, I could not have done that had we not had faculty who saw the benefit of this and were willing to, to initially give their time uh, to be able to bring this about. We also had a very favorable administrative situation here in that we have a president who is himself uh, an, an engineer and an innovator uh, and a provost, uh, both of whom have been extremely supportive of this and have allowed us to go around some pretty thick uh, existing infrastructure that would not have allowed a program like this uh, to take place had we not just been able to set aside some of the norms uh, that, that we had in terms of building programs, building out coursework, et cetera. So uh, overall, a very um, supportive, uh, innovative, 
environment, if you will, that allowed us to hack this. And again, I, I have to give another shout out uh, to our donors, uh, Jimmy and Dre, whose initial vision uh, uh, brought them to us and gave us the gift that also made it somewhat easy to be able to experiment with this for a few years, try some things out, and, uh, and get our feet on the ground with launching. I do think launching was critical. Uh, we could have theorized about this for a lot of years, Remy, and, um, and, I, and what we learned by being on the ground with the classes, with the students, in the space has been invaluable. Well, Erica, I think that's a, a beautiful way to end uh, this webinar and also this webinar series is with a message of how to get started and uh, looking ahead to the future. So I just want to thank you again for taking the time today. Um, I want to thank everyone for joining us as well. Um, great questions, great inputs. And uh, I'd like to wrap up by saying we'd love to hear from you. Um, please join the Education Exchange. Uh, stay tuned for continuation of uh, not only this webinar series, but also other webinar series and professional development events that we have going on. And let's continue this discussion. I think there's a lot of uh, momentum, there's a lot of interesting, innovative programs and student work to be shared, uh, and we want to help build that community and connection amongst all of you and share that out. So, Erica, thank you for being an inspiration today, and um, look forward My to talking pleasure. with you soon. Really important stuff. Thanks, thank you all. Me.